My name is Ian Cook. I'm the director of the Development Trust Association Scotland, uh, which, as you would expect, is the national organisation for development trusts. We're an independent member-led organisation, and we've got just under 200 members. So that's development trusts in urban, rural and island communities across Scotland. And I think that does give us quite an interesting perspective. I've been asked to talk this morning about community assets. And generally what I'll be talking about is the community ownership of physical assets and where that sits within community-led regeneration. This is quite clearly different from the asset-based approach to community development. I don't think the language is particularly helpful and there's a sort of confusion potentially of agendas. Um, but both approaches arguably could be seen as complementary. I'd like to begin by quoting somebody called Archie Thompson, who, when he was establishing Rent and Development Trust, famously said, we're not building good housing in Renton for local people to enjoy their poverty in. And I think that one line is not a bad critique of what's passed for Scottish regeneration policy for the last 30 years or so. When funding has been available, we've undoubtedly improved housing and sometimes the wider physical infrastructure. But we've made very little impact on levels of poverty and all the health and other problems associated with poverty. And often the regeneration which has taken place has been less than sustainable. Let's consider the role of communities within regeneration. In the worst regeneration initiatives, and I've certainly seen some of them, local people have been largely ignored. In the better initiatives, local people have been involved or engaged. But I would suggest that involving or engaging local people is not enough. If we want regeneration to be an ongoing sustainable process, then we need to have local communities as the drivers of regeneration. They need to feel that they have the ownership of the process that they need to that they control what's done, how it's done, who it's done with, and the pace at which it's done. The experience of development trusts, and it's a very recent experience over the last probably 10, 15 years, suggests that this happens best by developing strong, independent community anchor organisations. It doesn't matter what they are or what they're called or, or how they came into existence. They can be community-controlled housing associations, development trusts, community land initiatives, tenants' cooperatives, big credit unions. What's important is how, how they operate and what they do. Our view is that there are four principles which underpin successful community anchor organisations such as development trusts. Firstly, they quite clearly have to be independent and community led, so directly elected by local people, and working to an articulated community agenda. They also need to be multi-purpose organisations. They're trying to improve the quality of people's life, for local people's life, across the economic, social, cultural, and environmental agendas. And by doing that, they tend to achieve synergies that might not otherwise be there. So they're not single issue organizations. They do have to be committed to working in partnership, but partnerships that they form with specific organizations for specific purposes. What we're not talking about here is a sort of top-down, uh, multi-agency talking shops which have characterized partnership working in Scotland for the last 20 years or so. And these partnerships can be with the public sector, with other third sector partners, or with the private sector. They can be informal arrangements, and they can be formal arrangements, including joint ventures. And I think most importantly, community anchors need to have a strong enterprise focus. They may use grants to get activities happening, but from the start, they need to be committed to developing a trading income and trying to reduce dependency on grants, and in doing so, become more independent and more sustainable. I think that communities used to be much more resilient than they are these days and much more enterprising. I think we need to reclaim the term enterprise from big business, which I would argue isn't particularly enterprising if you look at it closely. And part of, what, uh, part of that community enterprise, and I suppose the part that's particularly associated with development trusts, is the ownership, development and management of physical assets. When I'm speaking to politicians, I often use this slide and ask them what these four photographs have in common. The um, top left is the, the stable block in Castle Milk, top right is Govan Hill work units, uh, the bottom left is Isla Gia, and the bottom right is Braemar Castle. And of course what they've got in common is that they're all owned and run by their local communities. And I think the point of that slide is that over the last probably 15 years or so in Scotland, largely under the media radar, there's been a silent revolution taking place with communities throughout Scotland taking more and more physical assets under community ownership. So what kind of assets are we talking about? 
Scotland has quite clearly significant levels of community controlled housing, housing associations, tenants, cooperatives. Out with housing, land is probably the most widely acknowledged uh, publicly community owned asset. Uh, people will be aware, be aware of land buyouts such as Egg, Gear, Noida, etc. And indeed, if you go up to the Western Isles in Scotland, just over 55% of all the land in the Western Isles is under community ownership. But in addition to housing and land, all sorts of buildings, businesses, work units, parks and open spaces, renewable energy projects, harbours, ferries, sports facilities, almost any physical asset you can think of will be in community ownership in some part of Scotland. And not only has there been a significant increase in community ownership, but done in the right way, I would argue it has proved to be largely successful. Community controlled housing has been a Scottish success story. None of the community land buyouts have failed. The Plunkett Foundation, I think it was about two years ago, looked at um, community owned and run shops in England. And what they discovered was that if you look back uh, about 20 years ago, there was 260 shops that were community owned and community run. 20 years later, 250 of these 260 shops were still trading. Now that's a, a success rate which the, pri the private sector can only dream about. And the reason for that success is that communities bring lots of different qualities to the ownership, development and management of assets. They invariably bring passion and commitment. It's not a town hall, it's our town hall. But they also bring local knowledge and they can tap into uh, local networks. I think really importantly, they bring creativity, that ability to think out the box. They can also achieve synergies, which for some reason public services, often working in departmental silos, don't even recognise. They can mobilise voluntary effort when that's appropriate, although clearly you need to get a balance between paid staff and volunteers. Communities can take a much more enterprising approach than councils and other public sector bodies are able to do. They can trade, they can take risks, they can form joint venture companies with other partners. And community organisations clearly have access to alternative funding, which the public sector doesn't have access to. And if they have charitable status, they can get some form of tax relief and tax exemption. What I would stress is that it's not about communities owning assets for the sake of it. It's what they can do with these assets that's important. And how that combination of community ownership and community enterprise can become the building block for community-led regeneration. I could give lots of examples, but the time doesn't permit it this morning, unfortunately. Within the Development Trust movement, we've been arguing for a number of years now about community ownership of assets, about community enterprise, and about community-led regeneration. So we're obviously pleased when last December the Scottish Government announced its new regeneration strategy, which signifies a major shift in policy direction. It's very early days yet, and I'd be the first to acknowledge that, but we are pleased to see the emphasis now being placed on community-led regeneration. Our sense is that the Scottish Government is not entirely sure what this means, what it looks like and how they're going to deliver it. So there's a potential opportunity for those of us who are involved uh, in community-led regeneration to contribute to the shaping, to the development and to the implementation of the strategy. Within the regeneration strategy, there is however clear recognition about the positive impact which the ownership of assets can have on communities. The strategy crucially recognises that top-down regeneration Regeneration that was done to communities, although often well-meaning, has at, ba at best been only partially successful. The strategy also acknowledges that regeneration should be a Scottish-wide activity, not just something which happens in a very small number of the more deprived communities in Scotland. And I think that's quite important, because regeneration, by and large, has been a very marginal activity within Scotland, and there's possibly an opportunity here to widen it and make it a much more mainstream activity. There's a big question about what resources will be put in place to deliver uh, community-led regeneration, and people like Andy have done some analysis of that and can probably speak better on that than I can. I'm not suggesting that community-led regeneration is some sort of panacea, but it does offer some new opportunities. It will certainly require fresh thinking, and it will require cultural change within local authorities and other public sector bodies. It will also require some cultural change in many communities. If community anchor organisations are going to be charged with leading regeneration processes, then they have to be fit for purpose. They have to be representative and inclusive. They have to be working to a community agenda. They will need to have appropriate governance structures and asset locks built in. They will need to have sufficient capacity to rise to the challenge. Where no community anchor exists, support will be needed to create one. 
perhaps we pulling together a smaller number of, a uh, number of small uh, community organisations into a bigger, more strategic community organisation. In some cases, support will almost certainly be needed to build capacity, reduce grant dependency, and foster a more enterprising approach. Done well, however, this kind of community-led regeneration has the potential to unleash local creativity, to create new synergies, to foster innovative responses and solutions, and to shift the power dynamic between local communities and the regeneration partners. When communities own assets and run services and activities, they become players. They can make things happen and they can influence others. And this contrasts sharply with local people simply being treated as consumers of public services. Regeneration in the widest sense takes place at different levels. And we need to be clear about which issues and challenges have the potential to, it, to be addressed at a local level. Community anchor organisations need to consider what they can do themselves, what they can do in partnership with others, and what things they need to be putting pressure on others to deliver. To some extent, the issue of poverty falls largely within the latter category. Unfortunately, local authorities do not have the power to, do, to redistribute income and wealth, to set benefit levels or control tax credits. But having said that, that doesn't mean there's nothing that can be done at a local level. Previous regeneration in initiatives have, I would argue, tended to equate poverty with unemployment. And while working with long-term unemployed people is important, it also has its limitations. We all know that many Scottish families living in poverty have one or more parents in work. But what have previous regeneration initiatives offered the women who are juggling three part-time jobs? or the young man with no formal education qualifications who's in an entry-level job with no real career prospects. These people have employment histories, they're job ready, but they're still living in poverty. These are the people who could be offered better economic opportunities within the sort of new community enterprises which could be created as part of community-led regeneration. So in conclusion, the community ownership of assets, when allied to a more enterprising approach, has the potential to be one of the central pillars of a new approach to local regeneration, community-led regeneration. For the first time in years, communities have the opportunity to take control, to redefine terms like partnership working, to build individual and collective confidence, to become more enterprising, and through all this, hopefully, to become more resilient. But don't take my word for it. I think you should go and visit some of the communities who are actually doing this in different parts of Scotland at the moment. I'll leave you with the addresses of our two websites. The first one is about development trust and the development trust approach. It's also got a profile on all our members so you can actually identify individual development trusts and what they're doing. Uh, another uh, website is one that's dedicated to the community ownership support service. Um, and it's where we support local communities who are interested in exploring taking on an asset or acquiring an asset. Thanks very much for listening and I look forward to taking part in the discussion. Thank you.